Uh, my name is uh, Arun Krishna Kumar, and I am from um, VMware. And uh, I want to just give a background about my team and uh, where we are coming from, so that uh, the problem can be set in context. Uh, so I am um, an engineer at a particular uh, product called VMware Cloud Director, which is a multi-tenant cloud provider. So people basically buy resources from VMware Cloud Director, and uh, they create their own clouds and sell it to other tenants. And uh, my team uh, builds uh, Kubernetes clusters for those. And uh, one of the uh, requirements which I have got in this team from my customers and also in earlier teams is about oh, how do we actually uh, let a user move to another, uh, leave the company or move to another team while still keeping their workloads active and while still keeping uh, all of their uh, mm, jobs intact. And uh, that is uh, the uh, overall uh, aspect of this talk. And it's not as uh, simple a problem uh, I mean, uh, it's not easy to solve in general, but uh, we can actually look at some aspects of this. So that's the uh, part of the talk. When sysadmins uh, pretty much quit, uh, at that time, how do you protect your Kubernetes cluster? And uh, it's an interesting thing, because you would think that it's a solved problem, but it is not. So yeah, usually humans and operators are owners of clusters or applications in clusters. And uh, these uh, humans change teams or companies. So we will uh, focus on one particular aspect of it which is um, when a cluster owner leaves a team, they have to, uh, so we need to, the product needs to have a clear way of uh, transferring ownership from this particular cluster owner to another particular cluster owner. And uh, uh, so the thing is that there are multiple uh, owners possible because it's a multi-tenant cloud. And um, in this particular case, we are discussing uh, in, uh, in the context of Kubernetes clusters created using KubeADM, uh, which is a very common uh, cluster creation mechanism nowadays. Um, and unlike the rest of the talks we have seen here, this is not very uh, industry generic, or uh, what do you say? It's not a, a very broad scope problem, but it's a particular problem. And uh, there are uh, solutions at least achievable. So it's not like, uh, hey, this is the industry, and I don't know what's going on, and uh, these are all the tools available. So this is more focused, and we will actually see how we can actually solve this. So as a solution, uh, the simple solution is you transfer cluster ownership to another user. That is the sort of a most obvious thing to do, and you revoke access from the old user. However, is it really feasible? Like, um, the problem is very clear. Actually, if you look at uh, the products which build it, this, uh, doing this is an afterthought. Uh, I've been in multiple startups and uh, also semi uh, non startup companies, and um, usually, whenever somebody actually has to leave, there's no UI based way or there's no simple click through saying that hey, take all of the resources which this person has, transfer it to another person, and uh, uh, while also keeping all of the workloads active and running and so on. So it is uh, an afterthought, and uh, people actually, whenever uh, it happens, uh, developers scramble, they sort of go behind to a database, and they begin to run queries and go and update all of these users and so on. So the solution is uh, sort of simple to state, but it is not necessarily easy to achieve. And uh, if you look at a Kubernetes cluster, you, uh, for example, have uh, the control plane, which I mean, the, you, uh, typically there's a load balancer. I'm not sure if my cursor is available. But yeah, so there's a load balancer fronting the whole cluster. So in a Kubernetes cluster, pretty much the IP address and port are the stable aspect. There's a load balancer. You have a series of nodes. Nodes could be con connected to disks or volumes. Those are the PVs, the persistent volume, uh, as mentioned in Kubernetes. You could have some GPUs attached to nodes and so on. And there are, each node has the compute and uh, storage and so on. And we would, uh, in a multi-tenant cloud, every single bit of this is owned by a user. It is actually referring to a user ID at the back. And when that user is deactivated, all of these have to move to another user. So we have other uh, logical aspects apart from the infrastructure aspects. Uh, there are metadata like uh, some set of secrets. There is root access to the node you will have to revoke. And uh, beyond all of this, there are application-related secrets, such as uh, if there's a Postgres database, there may be a Postgres uh, admin password. Now, if uh, you cannot, I mean, you will have to essentially rotate that password or change it. If there are a series of certificates which are used, you will have to revoke those or change it. So uh, it actually uh, just goes in a fractal manner. I mean, it just uh, keeps going further and further, depending on if you have an Apache web server, then what is the uh, essential uh, route behind that and admin user behind that, and you have to go and change this and so on. So the scope is uh, really very wide, and uh, people don't have a very clear system of saying that, hey, these are the things, and this is how you transfer. So uh, just to recap, um, on the cloud infra object level, you have nodes, 
which have to be transferred, networking components. So load balancer is a block, but for example, in VMware Cloud Director, you have a virtual service, uh, uh, load balancer pool, uh, port, port related some details like application port profile and so on. Uh, you have certificates which actually decrypt some of these load balancers uh, if there are application-based ingresses. Uh, you have storage, which has to be moved to the new user as well. And VMware Cloud Director had a bug wherein it could not move, and we are looking at solving this. So though we have done nearly everything, there is still one bit hanging. And uh, this has been a product which has been in the industry for a while, right? So that is the sort of the complexity in general. Uh, and uh, there are other complexities. So you take something from one user and you give it to another user. This has to be done by an administrator who actually can perform this operation. But now, does the destination have, user have enough quota to accept these VMs? Suppose they have five VMs and they have, their quota is five. They may not be able to take a cluster which has another 100 VMs. So those are some considerations which we will need to look at. They need to have permissions to be able to do all of the operations which were done by the user in the previous case and so on. So every object of the user must be transferred to the new one, logical and physical. Uh, so yeah, and administrator needs to have access to both objects and be able to transfer. So that is the other one. Uh, yeah, and in the infra objects, we have some logical and some physical. Logical ones are certificates, uh, root access to the nodes, and uh, the actual Kubernetes user accounts. User accounts cannot be transferred. You have to delete and pretty much recreate. Then you have port profiles, and uh, in uh, VMware Cloud Director, you have some other metadata, like defined entities and VM-based metadata. And Kubernetes objects are more standard. You have user-created secrets, secrets on the cluster. You have RBAC on the user, and user accounts, and cube config, and so on. Now we come to the actual problem. So all of these can be transferred. However, the admin cube config cannot be transferred. So the admin cube config is a break glass cube config. So you, uh, once a person has access to that particular cube config, there is no Kubernetes command or anything which just says, hey, go and uh, just uh, rotate these certificates or revoke this. You cannot revoke a uh, particular cube config. And uh, you cannot just say that, uh, um, so there are some mitigations to this. Uh, the admin cube config will be on the control plane nodes. So you can say, I will revoke the control plane nodes uh, root access, right? But an admin could have made a copy of this and kept it in his uh, cache. That will still work. I mean, uh, if the admin is a malicious admin who is quitting the company or uh, uh, he is, uh, I mean, basically, we won't be able to access it. So if the early cluster, and the other thing is, suppose the admin, you can, suppose you say that, uh, okay, I'll block the network, all of my clusters are internal. But if the admin moves to another team, in then uh, at that particular case also, uh, essentially you will not be able to block it because usually within a company, all of the IP addresses are accessible through a VPN. So yeah, essentially you cannot access network uh, unless there are provisions from the infra. You cannot change the cluster IP easily because the certificates and of Kubernetes uses it. So what is the solution? Revoking the admin cube config. So there are, there are open tickets in uh, Kubernetes, in Kubeadium, to actually handle this, and there is no solution. It cannot be revoked uh, easily, that's what I'm saying, because the purpose of this talk is to actually revoke. And the way to do that is the manual revocation. It is uh, definitely not a simple process. There are some documents which hint at it, they are at very high level, and uh, there are some resources available, but uh, they are really advanced, and uh, I couldn't uh, really make uh, head or tail of it. So uh, that is the whole uh, point of the talk. So some of the things which helped me were uh, essentially the last one, Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way, wherein he says how to create certs and so on. And um, Kubernetes also has some docs about manual rotation of CS certs, but uh, that is also limited. It just says where the certs are and uh, what they must contain. So the overall procedure essentially will be to create a root CA on your own. You can have a self-signed root CA. Then certs for ETCD, Kube Controller Manager. I mean, all of these uh, certs for API Server, Kubelet, and Kube Scheduler. Copy the certs to all of the nodes. Create new Kube config files uh, by using kubectl commands for all of these node, Kube Proxy, uh, Kube Controller Manager. By node, I mean uh, pretty much Kubelet, and also for the admin. And uh, then copy all of these cube config files to the nodes. And then there is the update of static manifests. All of these manifests for uh, uh, cube controller, uh, manager, cube API server, they all refer to these certs. And they refer to uh, multiple certs in a com I mean, complex way. Essentially, you have to do all of this. Then you create a new role in order to be able to access uh, kubelet. And then update the kubelet service files. So once you do all of those, then you will be able to essentially 
get a new admin cube config, and the old admin cube config will not be accessible. So just to be clear, rotation of the cube config does not touch admin. I mean, the old ones are still accessible. So that is what I would like to demo here. I have recorded a demo with uh, kind VA itself, but uh, we can potentially, uh, uh, we could have run uh, the demo here itself. So that does work. So no, oh, I have to stop the slideshow. Just give me a second. Right. So I think the, uh, the, the, the transposition tool that comes with the PKP allows you to navigate this very easily, right? Because from there you can manage all of that. And you can manage, but you cannot manually revoke and rotate the certificate. You can uh, uh, refresh the certificate, which is after the certificate expires after a year, so you just refresh it. It'll you, but uh, the old ones will still be accessible because they have an overlap of the last and the new. So even that yeah, that will not handle the admin cube config. There are uh, some tools from Google which do that. Yeah, and uh, anyway, so this is uh, what happens ultimately behind the scenes, even if uh, Google does this, it is uh, pretty much the same way. So I have a kind-based cluster and a demo based on kind over here. So I mean, it, it basically, this is the cluster. It's uh, one control plane and uh, one worker. Uh, this, is, uh, this was simpler to use as compared to accessing something over GCE or AWS or other things so that we don't have any network issues. And we can look at it. So. Uh, Creation of the cluster is pretty quick. I'll just forward it a minute or so, but uh, it, uh, oops, okay. And uh, uh, please ask questions as these go, go on. Uh, I will uh, pause at some aspects and uh, also show how the files look like. So once this, okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, so basically after that, uh, we can just uh, copy the admin cube config. So that is called getting copied from etc kubernetes admin.conf and that is uh, inside the thing. So we can just, um, uh, after copying it, we can just see that we have uh, uh, access to the pods and uh, so on. So this one will say no host because uh, see, uh, actually uh, this is uh, port mapped in the case of Kubernetes in general. In case of kind, kind is Kubernetes in Docker. So we'll have to just uh, edit that in the port map so that we can uh, very quickly do. Okay, I should run this as at two x the speed. But you can see all of the things now. So it has a kind, it has a kind control plane and a kind worker as nodes and uh, multiple things. So let me see if I can run it faster. Uh, playback speed, I'll just make it as 1.25. So I created a directory called mypki and I now begin to create certs here. So this is this base called uh, ca.pem. I mean ca.pem and ca.key.pem. So I use cfssl. Uh, that is Cloudflare SSL uh, to create it. It's just a uh, simpler uh, open SSL can be used. Likewise, uh, we need to create an admin. Uh, I mean, so yeah, basically this are request and CAPM is here. So the CA key is called CA dash key dot PM. That's why it's not shown there. Uh, and uh, we need to create the kubelet certs. So one of the things is the internal IP over here. So the internal IP is essentially obtained from the VM. That's the, that's not the, um, uh, so that is what uh, the uh, internal nodes IP is, and uh, many of these will directly come from the node. So that would have to be in the list of internal IPs. So just uh, you can add that. The external is 127. That is where you actually look at. So we are doing it for both the kind control plane and kind worker. So it's a loop. So these are the kubelet related certs. And then, 
So if you look at that, there is a, ignore the middle cube config, we'll generate that again. And uh, now the, uh, this one goes in a bit. So there's the controller manager and then the cube proxy. Uh, there are a bunch of these uh, certs which have to be created and used. So let me skip to the end of it, uh, rather because this uh, demo takes a little bit of time. Um, okay, there is only one, let it continue and then we can skip. CS scheduler. Yeah, this is the one which is uh, sort of uh, uh, interesting in the sense that, uh, yeah, these are just the host names. So this is one used by ETCD. And uh, so you need to have all of these uh, default SVC, default SVC dot cluster and so on, so that it, it begins to use it. And uh, yeah, so this 10.96.0.1 is the cluster IP. So that is what uh, I wanted to just show. So the admin dot cube con config is still uh, accessible. As you can see, it's called dot .orig. Uh, yeah, all those are accessible. Very soon it will become inaccessible once we change this. So yeah, this is the point where I'm uh, copying the certs. I copy it to something called my PKI. So the Kubernetes certs are actually underscore, under uh, ETC Kubernetes PKI itself. I've just put it under my PKI. So, and uh, the certs also need to be installed on that. So there is this update CA certificates because uh, this is like a Ubuntu uh, machine-like equivalent in uh, kind VM. So basically, that Docker machine is like a Ubuntu VM. Yeah. So that has in, uh, installed the certs. Uh, we have still not uh, changed anything uh, in the sense that uh, the next set is creation of cube configs. So we can uh, essentially skim through this. So we need to create one um, for each worker node. That is, the, these are the kubelet-related kube configs. Then uh, the next one is the kube proxy kube config and so on. So let me just uh, go forward. Um, yeah, you have the kube controller manager kube config, kube scheduler kube config. And uh, then we essentially ultimately have the whole lot. Um, the admin cube config also was created in the interim. Okay, and at this particular point, uh, we copy all of those into multiple nodes. So now we have a set of manifests, and these are the manifests which we'll be replacing. I'll let it replace and uh, show the cry cutl, but I want to actually go through the manifests uh, individually. So. Uh, basically, I want to show that uh, it is getting restarted. So if you look at it, uh, you can actually log into the uh, uh, machine and uh, you can do a cry cuttle PS. Uh, these are all Docker images, so code DNS and everything is there. This is under uh, window where I do the copy. And uh, as soon as you do the copy, Kubelet will start to restart it. Uh, so, I mean, if you do a PS minus A, you can see that some things have started to uh, exit. So ETCD immediately dies and then it'll start to come up. And until ETCD dies, the API server, I mean, API server will also die, it won't come up. And the last to come up will be uh, Cube Controller Manager. So this uh, just uh, takes some... Uh, cycles and it... Um, so yeah, basically after a while it uh, just uh, comes back up. It tried three times. And uh, basically you can look at the logs of Cube Controller Manager in CryCuttle and it is working. So this CryCuttle is like uh, internal Docker image logs. This uh, does not mean that we can actually access from outside. So the things are out. So now the interesting part is, the, uh, so the next part is the creation of the admin cube config. So basically now I'm going to use the new cube config, which has been created. And I want to install some roles into it. Uh, so it could not find the right port because we had to essentially change the IP address, I mean the port number, because it's mapped, right? So basically it's the same Docker PS and uh, change the port number. And this is the new admin cube config. And you can see that uh, once that is changed, uh, it should just work. So 
So once you actually add this, we can begin to see the pods from the new one. And the old one is a world admin cube config is uh, you know, unusable as of now. So uh, yeah, uh, I'll just uh, so basically I'll just uh, show one thing. So though the new cube config is access, I mean, um, before we do that, we just need to actually see once. Uh, uh, the thing is, the, the nodes and other things are accessible, but you won't be able to see the pod logs yet because the kubelet has to be restarted in order to see the pod logs. And uh, to do the kubelet, it is again you have to put in the certs for that, and so on. So you can actually see that uh, you can see all of the pods. Uh, however, if you actually try to get the logs, uh, uh, you actually get uh, access denied. You can just uh, I mean basically try something, and uh, so it says that uh, you need to be logged in, and so on. So the next part is to set the kubelet uh, service and to restart it. So that one, um, basically, there are two large files. Uh, many of these are, uh, I'll just go through the files right now. Because uh, as you can see, some of these, the uh, line number 525 and 526, OK, we can just come back to this. Uh, so the line number 525, the CLS, uh, TLS cert file, for example, it is referring to Mike PKI. So these were things which we created just now. So that is essentially the default. <laughs> Uh, yeah. One thing is, uh, yeah, to one gotcha sort of is that um, uh, you need to uh, sort of uh, delete the existing uh, um, cube configs. So actually, here uh, a few lines ago, I removed the uh, not the cube config, the varelib kubelet slash pki that is reused. So if you don't delete that, it will use the old certs. So you can. I'm just looking at the kubelet cert, and if you go to the bottom. Uh, you can see that actually certificates uh, have been rotated. So it ha it will shut down the client connections and restart with uh, new credentials. So that is. Yeah, it just wipes it out. Because the PKI is new, it just uh, goes and gets rid of all of the old ones and uh, cleans up and gets the new one. So you can see that uh, some of them are just created 29 seconds ago. That is the local prov path provisioner and the client NCI and so on. The ones which are four minutes ago are still uh, running. Those are uh, the. And this comes in the middle. But um, yeah, the ones which are running ETCD and so on, they don't get restarted because they have the right PKI. So Kubelet just restarts the others. And now um, uh, I just, uh, yeah, I mean, basically I'm just uh, showing that with the, uh, with the new cube config, you can still access. I mean, you can look at all of the logs and so on. So yeah, the same command for looking at the logs now uh, works. And uh, it has essentially created it. So, and the original cube config is not usable anymore. So this is what we set out to do to revoke this. And uh, uh, if you actually do this uh, admin.config, whatever, k get pods minus a, you get that this certificate is signed by a non-authority. And this is what we intended to do. Uh, however, there is no automation of this from the Kubernetes end, just to be clear. Uh, so we need to essentially manually revoke. And uh, let's get back to, that's the end of this uh, demo pretty much. Uh, the new cube config is accessible and it does it. So is that the end? Uh, yeah, there's nothing else. Uh, so one thing which I want to say is that uh, uh, the uh, kind worker, for example, we didn't change the worker's kubelets. So the worker, and we didn't change the certs in the worker or uh, update certs in the worker. So the worker is still uh, not, uh, yeah, they, are, they will need to be changed. So if you want to access the logs of the worker, it will not uh, show anything and uh, so on. So. Uh, that one has to be done. So this has to be done in a loop. So let's get back to the demo, I mean the post-demo thing. Uh, how are we on time? 4.14, okay. Right, so we still have quite a bit of time, right. So yeah, the limitations are, uh, yeah, there is a cluster downtime if you have a single node cluster. If you have multi-node clusters, then there is no downtime. Uh, however, all of these are uh, restarted. And a kubelet service has to be restarted on every node. So those are all uh, uh, limitations. There is a general risk. So once you start on this process, you can uh, retry and continue, but you have to complete. You cannot stop in the middle or anything like that. And uh, this has to be currently managed by custom scripts. Uh, there is no sort of a operator or anything which actually goes and does that. So that said, we know that uh, this is the case now. Uh, how do we, uh, going forward, what do we do? So there are some best practices which uh, we can use. So ne never have your root certificate in any of the nodes. 
it is always good to have our own root certificate somewhere and create a series of intermediate certs and give it. What I demoed was actually uh, like that. We had a ca.pem uh, alone and uh, ca.pem and ca.key, but uh, however, we, can, uh, we, could, we created a lot of etcd certs and so on as intermediate certs, cube, proxy cert, and uh, controller manager, and we pushed that. And uh, yeah, so that will be used by Kubernetes to sign some things. So that is one which I found, uh, at least uh, there is this uh, link wherein uh, this person actually gave in uh, some details, though not the end. Uh, so yeah, the Kubernetes best practice also says that uh, do not send any keys into the cluster. So they say that uh, generate every single thing and send it. Uh, however, uh, yeah, that has to be scripted quite a bit. KubeADM uh, sort of allows it. So it says that you can, as long as you create it and push it, you can skip the step in the init phase. However, it's not very simple. So to tie it all together, one of the things is that uh, we, uh, this is on the Kubernetes side. However, on the infra side, it is a large problem again. You have to be able to, ready to uh, move every single uh, resource object to another user. And uh, those are the uh, things which uh, has to be already planned and done. Uh, use the external CA, that is a simple thing, and uh, use an intermediate CA uh, to keep the roots secure. And if any intermediate CA is compromised, just uh, revoke the cert and manually rotate certs. Uh, so the other thing which we have not covered is uh, there can be a series of users which have been created by the old administrator. Uh, those have to be deleted and uh, recreated. So that is also like a sort of a uh, pain <laughs> given it, because we don't know how many other applications that uh, user is linked to and so on. So this is a basically uh, <laughs> quite a large disruptive uh, uh, effect, and uh, this has to be made uh, streamlined in some way. But uh, all of this will have to do. And we have still not got into what happens if the Postgres administrator's password is lost, right? So that is another set, or uh, all of the other uh, application-related passwords. So that is a, another other set. So yeah, Q and A, or any particular thing. Yeah. So this is a bit uh, unlike the other talks, mainly because uh, yeah, this is not uh, as global in scope as those, and it's for a particular problem. <laughs>